uh, 12. That's a little bit ahead of us here. Now, this concept of apostasy that we're dealing with is not simply indifference or error or even getting tangled up with a heresy. The concept of apostasy is actually a rejection of the truth of God. People that received light but not life. People that have the written word but not the living word in them. And the examples we're going to discover obviously include Judas Iscariot. We don't have, it's not mentioned in the epistle, but that's an obvious example of the extreme apostate. But the three that are going to be mentioned, this thing climaxes up in verse 11, will be Cain, Balaam, and Korah. And we'll deal with that when we get there. But those, the earliest apostate is Cain, Cain and Abel. What's really going on there? We're going to take this issue all the way to the gates of Eden and start there. And what is Balaam all about? This strange character that surfaced in the book of Numbers that is featured so prominently in the book of Revelation. We'll talk about Balaam a bit. And of course, Korah, which, uh, you know, uh, discovers what, how God enforces his authority in some interesting ways. Now, what manner of men are these? These are men that creep in privately, privately, secretly. They settle down alongside false teachers that bring in damnable heresies, and we saw that in 2 Peter 2 1 earlier. There are three identifiers of these apostates. They're ungodly, whatever that means. They pervert the grace of God into lasciviousness, and they deny our Lord and Savior. Those are the three identifiers. And by the way, those three identifiers fit the three that are going to climax the epistle in verse 11. Cain of ungodliness, Balaam in perverting the grace of God, and Korah denying God's appointed leader at that time. So there's a parallelism of the three that are chosen with these three identifying characteristics that the Holy Spirit uh, lays out for us. We use the term ungodly. What do we really mean? Someone's destitute of a rever reverential awe of God. That's what being ungodly means. It doesn't have to be a militant atheist to be ungodly. It's just somebody who does not have a reverential attitude of awe toward God. And look around at our society. You don't have to be guilty of pornographic films on cable TV to be ungodly. All you have to do is be a secular humanist who doesn't really acknowledge or recognize the existence of God in operative in our lives. The word ungodly. It can be someone, according to 2 Timothy 3.5, who has the form but denies the power of God. It's Romans 1.16. It's someone who denies the gospel of Christ. That's easy. Someone in Philippians 3.10, someone that denies the transforming power of new life. In other words, someone could be ungodly if he isn't embracing the essential truths of God. Now, the interesting thing um, from, from, from the Old several Old Testament references, it's the heart, not the outward appearances, that's the key. It's not the appearance of God in this. It's where are they at really? Now, let me give you an example of something that appears pleasant and rational. This whole, you, you, we hear a lot about the brotherhood of man. All men are brothers. Isn't that a pleasant, easy idea? Very comfortable, very popular. The brotherhood of man. How many apparently worthwhile charities and efforts are under that banner? The only problem with that is, well, there's several problems with it. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus Christ speaks, speaking to part of the crowd, the pharisaical part of the crowd, ye are of your father the devil, and the works of your father ye will do. Remember that? Turn with me to John 8. I love John 8 because it's so tactful. <laughs> and it's so tactful. John 8 is kind of fun because when you get down to about verse 19, there's a little dialogue going on with Jesus Christ and the Pharisees, and in the politeness of the King James, you miss it. In verse 18, Jesus said, I am the one that beareth witness of myself. The Father that sent me beareth witness of me. And then they say to him, Where is thy Father? Now what you miss is the implied snide crack. They're, a, they're calling him a bastard. They're alluding to his illegitimate illegitimacy vis-a-vis -vis Joseph and Mary. And Jesus just answers, you, need, you know neither me nor my Father. And he goes on. And this builds up so that by the t before the chapter is over, he gives them a lesson. He doesn't defend his legitimacy, but he comments on theirs. <laughs> and this all builds up pretty neat because it gets uh, to verse 44 where he says, Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And about when did, who did he murder? 
Adam, you bet. The first murder wasn't Cain and Abel. The first murder was Satan's murdering of Adam by getting Adam to become mortal, in effect. Uh, and but, but not in truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, and, for he's a liar and the father of it. And he goes on here, and uh, so forth. And I, and, and I love the way it ends, where he, he claims to be the voice in the burning bush. He says, you know, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Verse 56, your, Abra your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. The Jews said unto him, well, you're not yet 50 years old. How can, you see, how can you say you've seen Abraham? Jesus said, verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And he's using the very structure that uh, the voice from the burning bush said to Moses. And that's really uh, uh, the, it's the I am statement. The book, Gospel of John is built about seven, around seven I am statements by Jesus Christ. Now you and I missed that, but they didn't because in verse 59 they tried to stone him. They understood that that was what he was saying. Anyway... Um, Universal brotherhood of man. It's interesting to me that, uh, first of all, we need to understand that all men are not brothers. There are members in the family of God and there are members that are not. And that sounds bigoted, it sounds narrow, but that's what God tells us. And that's the brotherhood of man sounds appealing, but is, denies the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's very interesting to me that in Europe there's a confederation of nations. We call it the common market, more properly called the European community. You may know they have a parliament, they have a budget, they have things. Did you know they have a national anthem? You didn't know that. Did you know what the national anthem of the European community is? Schiller's Ode to Joy under Beethoven's Ninth. The next time you get a chance to read a libretto of Beethoven's, it's that fabulous music. We sometimes we have a hymn that goes to the same music, you know. All the mentioned brood and brooder. All men are brothers. Schiller's Ode to Joy. It's an eloquent exclamation of the brotherhood of man. How interesting it is that this federation of nations that comprise the original Roman Empire are emerging as a confederation built on world trade, as Revelation 17 and 18 suggest, and maybe the precursor to a lot of other interesting things. It's interesting that their national anthem is a brotherhood of man. So I thought I'd share that with you. Moving on. Ungodly is the first part of apostasy. Secondly, it perverts the grace of God and lasciviousness. It's not hard for us to visualize how someone can pervert Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. By the, by the grace of God we are saved, so therefore we have liberty in Christ, therefore we, it's anything we do is all right. And how easy it is to use the liberty of Christ to be turned into lasciviousness. What does the grace of Jesus Christ call the Christian to really do? Turn to Titus 2. Nothing else will break open your Bibles and turn to pages you may not even turn to yet. Titus chapter 2. Let's talk about what the grace of God. You know, we talked a lot in our studies about the difference between grace and works and so forth. Great. Grace is our liberty in Christ. But what should that lead to? What should that freedom in Christ lead to? Freedom from the law. Freedom from works. Reliance entirely on Jesus Christ's completed work on the cross. What does that lead to? Titus tells us in chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, and looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he goes on. What do we mean by perverting the grace of God? Well, number one, a Christian walk that's constructive, but also I might suggest that the, re the rejection of the Word of God occurs whenever it's displaced by tradition, custom, loyalty to some other organization. Very worthwhile things, very attractive things. When they displace the primacy of the Word of God in your life, that's perverting the grace of God. Interesting, isn't it? Tradition, custom, creed, loyalty to an organization, you name it. Anything that gets in the way, anything that yields your loyalty to something other than His Word is dangerous. I know. I've been loyal to a lot of things that cause me a lot of introspection now. There's only one thing you and I want to be primarily loyal to, and that's His Word. Ungodly perverts the grace of God. The third thing, the obvious thing, is he that the apostate denies our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. There are four ideas embodied in this denial, our only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you really dissect that, you discover there's four items in there. One is the sovereignty, pre-existent creator of all things. We go into Colossians and elsewhere to establish that. Secondly, He is the Lord of all true believers. The name Jesus 
refers to Jehovah the Savior, our martyr substitute, he who died for us, his 